Thank you very much. I think all of us, as inheritors of a country that's based on immigration, favor immigration. The question is, at what numbers? There's never been a period quite in our history where we've had completely open borders. We've always regulated to some degree, sometimes less successfully than other immigration. I think the reason that you're here is really not about immigration. It's about illegal immigration. That is, this new phenomenon. We've always had illegal immigration, but not in the numbers that we've had in the last 30 years. And that seems to be what the current controversy, especially in the Congress, is all about. We'll talk about immigration, but we're really talking about illegal immigration. And it's been deliberately blurred by a lot of people on both sides of the issue. But there is a distinction between favoring immigration and having it controlled and allowing open borders that encourages or tolerates illegal immigration. I'd like to make that distinction. The second thing is it's not specifically an economic issue, a social issue, a political issue. It's all of them, ethical issue. Let me just give you an example of the ambiguity. The University of California is trying to appeal to minority students in the San Joaquin Valley. So they've opened a new University of California campus, Kent campus. It has a budget of $20 million. It's underfunded, and it's nearing disaster, to be quite frank, because of budgetary constraints. But presently, we have 15,000. I'm not saying there's a direct correlation, but to give you some idea of the cost and the expenses and the consequences of that cost, we have 15,000 people from Mexico here illegally in the California penal system. It costs $500 million, which is roughly 20 times the budget of that campus. And if you count county jails and city jails, that number may be up to 30,000 to 40,000 and have an aggregate cost of a billion and a half dollars per year. One of the things you quickly learn about the debate, especially in the sphere of illegal immigration, is that when you do have this many people living in the United States, there is no data. Both sides try to produce data. I noticed that I just read recently that the amount of taxes that are paid on the books by illegal workers is a shortfall of about $10 billion nationwide versus the entitlements they draw. State of California advocates for closed border argue instead it's $10 billion just in California. But when you have an amorphous group where nobody can agree on how many people are coming across the border, we have a general idea that 3 million people per year try to come to the United States illegally, and perhaps a million to a million and a half do. I've heard a low end of 8 million are residing illegally, and up, I think Barron suggested, 18 million on the top end. When you don't have that data, then there's all sorts of models and speculation that's allowed to happen. So we really don't know the size of the problem, and we don't know the exact economic effects of it because nobody knows the size of the pool who's here, and especially the size of the pool who's in the system. Some people may have false names and have Social Security and pain. Some people are just paying in cash. Some suggest that 55 percent of all the wages paid to illegal aliens are not run through the Social Security system. They're just cash. Empirically, from my experience growing up in rural California, I think it's higher. About 60 to 70 percent of the people who are working in construction or agriculture or hotels or are here illegally from Mexico are just being paid in cash. So it's very hard to get a specific number. One of the things I think is ironic about it is we use political labels a lot. Often people on the left will call people worried about illegal immigration racist. People on the right suggest that they're nativist or protectionist. But what strikes me about the issue is the illiberal nature of it in a variety of ways. That is, the illiberal nature of allowing unchecked illegal immigration. And let me just give you two or three examples of what I mean by that. The first is that we have literally tens of thousands of people who like to enter the United States legally, especially from places such as India, the Philippines, Korea. It takes anywhere from two to seven years to do it legally. And yet, because perhaps our historical relationship with Mexico, the proximity of Mexico, our constituencies that are pro-Mexican government within the United States, we allow, as I said, a million people, three million people try to come, but at least a million people cut in the line, so to speak. That's not fair to the people who try to come legally. The second is that we talk about alien labor or immigrant labor in a static sense, and we forget the aging process that goes on. 
a person who comes to the United States at 18 or 19 from Oaxaca is one of the hardest workers in the world. There's no doubt about it. Anybody who's gone to Central California and seen people work in construction and uh, agriculture will see that this country as a whole benefits from that worker because he takes seven to eight dollars or nine dollars in cash. Uh, the employer saves with the deductions in a lot of cases. And even if he doesn't uh, pay off the books, it's, it's a low-wage labor. The person's young, usually not married and healthy. But as the aging process proceeds, and a person is alone here, and he has three strikes against him or her, i.e., he's here illegally, he usually does not know English, and the average, a, uh, the average level of education is usually the eighth grade. Um, what happens is that that entry-level job, whether it's landscape or construction, becomes a dead-end job. And if a person makes one mistake, falls off a ladder, hurts a knee, gains weight, becomes ill, then that employer is not obligated to take care of him, and that becomes a ward of the state, that person. So whether that worker who is here illegal is a boon or bust to the economy depends on the age cycle in which he's participating. And the studies that I've read that suggests that perhaps from 18 to 40, that's a plus for the U.S. economy, but from 40 on, it's not. And one of the striking things, again, from empirical experience that I've seen is this phenomenon of people who work very, very hard from Mexico as first-generation workers, and then their children who have never been to Mexico and do not speak Spanish well and yet have not been given the tools to compete in a a uh, very competitive American side become very bitter about the fate of their parents. And as I, I talked to a contract, uh, contractor not long ago, and as he said to me, I asked him how many people were on his crew were legal and being paid through the so-called books. He said none. He had eight workers. He said they're the best workers in the world. I only insist on three things. They can't speak English, they can't have any tattoos, and they can't have a shaved head. And what he meant by that is he did not want a second generation, what he called gang type. He wanted people from Oaxaca who were hardworking but had not been acculturated to the American system. So, and I, think, I don't think that's an isolated example. So there's a cynicism involved about recycling human capital almost. And then uh, great controversy about the effect of illegal uh, aliens on the labor scale. The Department of Commerce suggested it was a prime factor in keeping wages static. We don't know whether it helps or hurts unemployment, but I, I will give you another example. Last summer, the chairman of the Central California Farm Bureau said that if the raisin industry, of which I was a part, did not have 30,000 workers from central Mexico, the industry would go broke, guest workers. At the time he said that, the unemployment rate in Fresno County was 12%. So there's something going on there, and you can argue, well, we can't get workers because they won't do that job. That's fine, but at least you should ask yourself, why is that happening when we have counties that need workers from Mexico that have unemployment rates per county of 8 to 10 percent? There's something going on ethically, psychologically, morally, or socially that says to Americans, you don't have to do that type of work. Somebody else will do that for you at a cheaper rate. Uh, as a classicist, we always use this uh, Latin phrase, qui bono. Why do we have this system of 10 to 12 million illegal aliens? Who does it benefit, that Latin phrase, to whose good? The answer is everybody seems to benefit. Mexican government, in three ways. Mexican uh, illegal immigrants contribute about $50 billion to Mexico and Central America and remittances that prop up the, Ameri the Mexican government. Now, we think that's good for Mexico, and it is, but it often comes at the expense of immigrant laborers. If you go to a community like Mendota or San Joaquin, California, you will see very quickly that they are bankrupt. They're wards of Fresno County in the state because anybody who's making 10 or $12 and sends four to five back will not have disposable income to be taxed upon or to invest in the local community. So often in communities that are, are becoming apartheid in California, we have pyramidal societies an elite on top that employs them, and a lower helot class on the bottom who's sending much of their wages down to Mexico. Mexican government also finds that the larger the expatriate community is in California or the American Southwest, the stronger the advocacy they have for Mexican relations vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And why do they want that strong advocacy? Because this is sort of a safety uh, 
valve in reverse for them. They will never embrace structural reform as long as they can export people that might be potential dissidents. Now, it is true that the Mexican population rate is slowing. We have things like Walmart. But if you look at the Mexican energy sector, the Mexican banking sector, the Mexican judicial system, the Mexican political system, a lot of these structural reforms have not taken place because they count on, at any given time, a large pool of many millions of Mexicans who did not find that system equitable to come to the United States. One of the great ironies, of course, was there was a poll not long ago by the Pew Foundation and the Zogby as well, and it suggested that 58 percent of Mexican citizens felt that the American Southwest still belonged to Mexico and that they had a right to go through an open border. But even more interesting was almost 50 percent said they would migrate themselves. This shows you the deep psychological confusion about the issue because it essentially says our system does not work and we want to leave it, but the place that we leave should belong to Mexico. And that is mutually contradictory. Why would anybody want to maintain a Mexican sovereignty over a system that they want to flee? It doesn't make any sense. But it shows you this deep, deep sense of pride and frustration that people have when they come here. So Mexico benefits. So do employers who get cheap labor and they find that they cannot organize for unionization. They're subject to exploitation. I know that's sort of a canard, but I find it true, especially when the state will step in and provide a subsidy of entitlement, Section 8 housing, support for education for children. Again, this is a deeply ambivalent ethical issue. As a person who taught 20 years in the California state system, I had literally dozens of students who were here illegally whose parents were paid off the books, but because they were residents of California, they had in-state tuition rates and paid a fraction, a third, I should say, of my other students who were also Hispanic, who were legal from Arizona and New Mexico, who paid three times the amount to go to the California State University system because they had done it legally, even though the argument that the people in-state paid taxes was not really a cogent one when they were not paying state income taxes because their parents were not on the books. I know sales tax helps a little bit, but it wasn't quite enough to justify that discrepancy. And finally, there's us, all the middle class. There has been a radical change in the American view toward work. Whether we like it or not, getting back to the anecdote I said about the California Farm Bureau, he was asked when he made that statement, how many teenagers in Fresno County are at the mall on any given day? And people suggested 5,000 to 10,000. There's been a difference in the attitude and respect for hard work. One of the things about this whole guest worker issue I think is very important is it assumes that all of our lawns were cut by people illegally from Mexico before, that none of us ever grew up cutting lawns, that all of our dishes were washed, all of our beds were made by people who were here illegally from Mexico. Because if you think that that were to cease, that we could not go on. But all you have to do is leave the American Southwest and go to other states in the Union, including your own, and you will see that, in fact, a lot of these jobs are done by people who are legal immigrants or natives, and that part of it is a psychological issue that we have given the privileges of the aristocratic class to have servants for your parents and the rest homes, your babysitters, cooks, maids, and landscapers to the middle class. That's been a great entitlement to the middle class, but it comes at, as I said, social, ethical, moral, and political cost. Thank you very much. We'll now have Dr. Powell's opening statement for 15 minutes. All right, thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today about immigration. I'm particularly pleased to share the stage with Victor Davis Hanson. Though I strongly disagree with some of his positions, I think he approaches immigration with a level of frankness and honesty that's rare in this often emotionally charged debate. So let me start with a point of agreement between us and, I guess, everybody up here on stage. America's current immigration rules should be changed. They're not working well. Current policies are bad for Mexicans who face a harrowing journey through the American desert to get here. They're bad for U.S. property owners near the Mexican border who have their property trespassed on. They strain social services and local communities. 
And despite illegal immigration, employers are still looking for more labor. I think it would be fair to say that it's not a good system for pretty much all parties involved. The question for today's debate is how should a free society go about handling immigration? So first I think we need to decide what a free society is or define it. America may be one of the freest countries in the world today, but I don't think it's synonymous with a free society. We have thousands of laws and regulations that restrict economic and social freedoms. My vision of a free society I think is one that's closer to what the founders of this country envisioned, something along the lines of the right to life, liberty, and property. A free society should protect an individual's life from being damaged or cut short through coercive actions of others. It should protect an individual's private property from trespass by either foreign or domestic invaders. And it should respect the liberty of the individual to do what he wants so long as he doesn't infringe upon the rights of others. Part of what that liberty applies is a freedom of association and a freedom of non-association. People should be free to interact in business and pleasure with whoever is willing to interact with them. And similarly, people should not be forced to interact with those that they do not wish to. I think a free society must handle immigration while respecting these rights of its own citizens. Current immigration policy fails miserably at this. Groups like the Minutemen patrol the Mexican border and complain about immigrants trespassing on their land and often leaving garbage and damage behind. So their property rights and freedom of association are not being protected by the government. Meanwhile, there are others in America who want to associate with Mexican immigrants, workers who want to hire them, relatives who want to bring family members here, and landlords who would wish to rent to them. For these Americans, the current restrictions on immigration violate their liberty to associate freely with the people they wish to. So what type of reform is necessary? Now, I know this is going to sound like a radical reform, but I still think it's the only one consistent with the principles of a free society. And that is free and open immigration that allows in all immigrants in any quantity from any destination so long as they're free of disease or known terrorists with a criminal record. And as long as there's some private citizen here who's willing to provide them a place to live or a job. To be clear on this, I'm not advocating an open border where you can jump across at any point at any time. I mean through legal checkpoints so that we can verify that the people coming in are not criminals and terrorists. An unrestricted immigration policy would obviously respect the freedom of association of Americans who want to hire them. However, I also think it would better respect the freedom of non-association of the people living on the Mexican border right now. Once we move to unrestricted immigration through legal checkpoints, the need of trespassing across all this property on the border to sneak in would disappear. So these people's rights would be better respected as well. Now, to deal with some of the secondary consequences of this, though, because a policy of unrestricted immigration is definitely going to have other consequences that follow. But I think the problems that we see with current immigration are problems of the perverse institutional environment that we provide the immigrants, both legal and illegal, who come here. So let me address three of these major areas of concern. Economic, welfare state, slash assimilation, and security. As an economist, I'll begin with that. Most people recognize that immigration brings economic benefits. If it didn't, the workers wouldn't come here and the employers wouldn't be looking to hire them. But as Victor mentioned, the estimates of these gains vary significantly. I take one of the critics of immigration, actually, I'll quote his estimate here. George Borjas is a Harvard economist and a longtime critic of immigration. He uses what economists call a Harburger Triangle estimate to figure out the gains. I couldn't resist when I was on the plane on my way here. I drew up the graph and was going to show you guys how we do that. But then when I was on the phone last night with my wife, she said, don't be boring. I said, well, I can't promise that, but I guess I can drop the graph. Anyhow, his latest estimates are coming out in David Henderson's Encyclopedia of Economics. David's a fellow with you at Hoover, actually. And what he finds is that it increases GDP growth, and this is both legal and illegal immigration, by about 0.2 percentage points a year, or $22 billion. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot. Compounded over time, it is significant gains for our economy. But I think there's good reasons why we think Borjas underestimates these gains. In trade policy, an article in the Journal of Political Economy estimated that once you count for the political lobbying cost of trade restrictions, the losses to the economy increased by a factor of 10 compared to just the triangle estimates. That would turn a $22 billion immigration shortfall, or excuse me, turn a $22 billion immigration gain into $220 billion. Now we're talking about something a lot more significant. And I think given the passion and emotions that surround the immigration debate, I don't think this is at all unrealistic to 
to transfer it over to that area. Um, although people grant that on net, even if we dispute the size of the gain that comes from immigrants coming here, uh, most people on net believe that it does benefit us in some way. The objections usually come to it costing jobs or wages to decrease for natives who already live here. But a fundamental truth about our economy is that as long as we desire more goods and services than we have, the number of jobs is virtually unlimited. When we have more workers, we create more jobs. Since World War II, total employment and the size of the labor force have tracked each other pretty closely. This is despite big changes in immigration flows and the massive entry into the, uh, of women into the workforce. We've simply created more jobs for all the workers who have come in. We've had no increase in long-term structural unemployment associated with the big increase in the labor force. What about wages? Immigration increases the supply of domestic labor. Basic economic reasoning shows that when you increase the supply of any good, holding other things constant, you're going to push the price down. However, immigration brings many secondary effects, so all else isn't constant. Uh, most immediately, when immigrants earn money, they demand goods and services. This increases the demand for other goods and services and creates jobs there. Less obvious, but no less important, is that with, as a consequence of immigration, is that with a greater supply of labor, we have more goods and services. With more goods and services to go around, that leads to lower prices and an increase in the purchasing power of existing American wages. Finally, uh, a labor force can raise the profitability of capital investment. If increased capital flows match the increased labor force, there's no reason at all why, uh, by why wages would be impressed, uh, depressed. Uh, the secondary causes of immigration that I've mentioned here are also found in the professional economics literature. So instead of any individual study, the comprehensive sur survey published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, this is the outlet that does an entire survey of the literature and sees what conclusions can be drawn from the economic research, comes to the following conclusion. Despite the popular belief that immigrants have large adverse impact on the wages and employment opportunities of the native-born population, the literature on this question does not provide much support for the conclusion. Ultimately, as an economist looking at it, the case for open immigration is not fundamentally different than the case for free trade or capital mobility, allowing, trade, allowing goods and services, capital, or labor to move, move freely allows them to go to their most efficient uses and bring gains to the domestic and the world economies. Now, although immigration has overall economic benefits, there are also costs that taxpayers bear. The most obvious occurs when an immigrant receives welfare uh, or subsidized education or one of these other things that we provide them. Uh, in California, for instance, a two-child family uh, can receive over 16,000 in direct welfare benefits. I mean, this exceeds the per capita income of many countries in the world, so it would obviously be a job of immigrants who want to come here. Uh, current levels of immigration are straining local provision of social services because of the way taxes and spending are allocated. Uh, however, the National Academy of Science study on this, they found over a lifetime an immigrant contributes more money to the U.S. economy than they take in social services. Similarly, Borhars, an immigration critic, he estimates that immigrants cost $16 billion more than their taxes. Uh, however, remember, his conservative estimate of the overall gains to our economy were $22 billion a year. Uh, in principle, the gains from current immigration, if they were reallocated, we could easily cover the taxpayer costs of having the immigrants come in, even at current levels of social services. Immigration isn't the problem for this. Tax and spending decisions are. Now, a complete open immigration policy would obviously create greater drains. Economist Milton Friedman, another colleague of yours at Hoover, has said, it's just obvious that you can't have free immigration and a welfare state. Fundamentally, I agree. But is a welfare state part of a free society? Massive government transfers from some citizens to others is certainly not part of the central creed that our founding fathers had in mind. At a minimum, reform should not allow immigrants to come in here for tax-funded services. Uh, but more fundamentally, if we're ha to have a free society, effort should be placed on abolishing the welfare state for immigrants and natives alike. In either case, tax-funded social transfers are a problem. They create inefficiencies and limit freedom of others. But they're not a problem of immigration per se, so not an objection to open borders. They're a separate issue. Uh, in the correct institutional setting, the immigration, immigration is an unambiguous economic gain for us. Uh, reform towards the institutions that would make it an unambiguous gain is what's necessary. So to move for a second beyond economics, culture, American values, self-reliance, hard work, individual initiative. Couldn't bringing people in from other cultures undermine those values or even worse, pervert our politics? I think this is an important question. American values have changed over the last 200 years. 
most of the public has moved away from a lot of these traditional American values. People have learned that instead of serving consumers to get ahead, they can lobby the government for transfers, use the court system for fraudulent lawsuits, beg antitrust regulators to limit their more efficient competitors, take government handouts between jobs, or even worse, nearly permanently. Values have changed as our institutional environment has changed, as acts of Congress and court decisions have eroded our original constitutional environment. They've distorted incentives facing people in the economy. As benefits to unproductive entrepreneurship, what economists call rent-seeking or transfer-seeking, as these have increased, more people engage in transfer-seeking. This has eroded our culture. The costs and benefits people face have influenced our cultural values over time. It's true for both immigrants and natives. Before, immigrants assimilated into a culture of hard work and self-reliance. Today, they are taught to assimilate into a system of government reliance, where failure and laziness are not punished. Unfortunately, the welfare state not only makes them less productive, it also teaches them to undermine our old culture and American values that made us successful. To see this, that it's not an immigration issue on this, think of the many natural experiments. China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, North and South Korea, Ireland, and the Republican Ireland. All of these places have essentially the same geography, the same ethnicity, the same background, but the cultures are very different, and so is the economic performance. In each case, one group was able to adopt a system of market principles similar to the United States. Their economy flourished and their culture grew to support it. Otherwise, a similar group of people adopted different institutions and took a radically different path. Ethnicity alone doesn't determine what values a group will support. Culture evolves to respond to these costs and benefits over time. We need to focus on creating the right institutional environment in the U.S. so that immigrants who come here will assimilate into the old American values, not the new ones perverted by our nanny state and an educational system where quite often feeling good is more important than learning. A final issue I want to mention is security. What about a wave of terrorists trying to immigrate? Just because we have open border immigration policy doesn't mean that we can't exclude criminals and known terrorists. People with criminal records should not be free to roam our street, whether they're a foreigner or a native of the United States. By moving to a system of open immigration, we could slow the flow of current illegal border crossings. As long as it was predictable that we would let anyone in who enters through legal checkpoints, most of them would have no need to go traipsing through the desert and trying to skirt around our system. Instead, only the few who actually have criminal records or are terrorist threats would go there and there wouldn't be millions of other Mexicans who are coming here to work to try to hide among. So it would actually become easier to catch them, not harder. Right now, we do a horrible job of preventing people from getting in, and it's just because there's this flood that the enforcement can't keep up with. Uh, criminal activity of immigrants once they're here is also a problem, as, as Victor mentioned, in the cost of incarcerating them. Uh, sometimes police even for, uh, fail to enforce the law against current illegal immigrants. When they are enforced, there's the incarceration and court costs. Now, if we move to a system, though, of open immigration, where immigrants who came here didn't have to work illegally and could be on the books, the increase in tax revenue could almost certainly cover this expense. But even with that, we could reform the prison system, too. There's nothing that says we have to accept all immigrants forever unconditionally. We can let them in as long as they respect American values and property rights. Perhaps deportation is the right thing to do once you've demonstrated that you're not here to work and that you're here to cause trouble. So to summarize my initial statement, a free society should protect property rights, life, liberty, and the freedom of association. We can and should have open immigration while maintaining these freedoms. Our current immigration and social policies are not consistent with a free society, and that is why we have the problems that we do. Reforming these illiberal aspects of our society while opening our borders will make us freer and more prosperous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. And now we'll have the uh, area of rebuttal, so five minutes, Dr. Hansen, to discuss or challenge whatever might have been said by Dr. Powell. Thank you. Um, we were, a great deal of what Dr. Powell said, but when he said that we, he wasn't quite for open borders, that he wanted to make sure that people who entered the United States were scrutinized for criminal activity, drug use, a willingness to assimilate, accept America value, American values and language, that's basically the policy we have now that's not being enforced. In other words, we, pri we apply criteria to people who want to come to the United States, and sometimes that number is around 250,000 that we let in if they satisfy that criteria. Nobody really wants an open borders where we don't ask those questions. I, like, I agree that we must go back to the vision of the founders, but I can't think of a time in American history when the spirit of the founders, or indeed the founders themselves, 
favored an open border system where people simply were just allowed to come to the United States. Citizenship and whether you define it as being born in the United States yourself or being naturalized, or it always has implied in the history of the American, the history of the West, a government or a civic responsibility and process to scrutinize people that are allowed into the Commonwealth. Uh, think for a minute, if we let anybody in who wanted to come in and, and we didn't ask very serious questions, what would be the natural limit to it? I suppose that we have just as much to offer, offer as India and China. They're about the same size in geographical expanse. Would we have a billion people in the United States? Uh, going back to that poll, the Zogby poll said that 50% of the 100 million plus in Mexico said if given the chance, they would come across the border immediately. That would be 50 million people who would come right away. And given all of South America, you could envision that we very easily could, in quite short order, reach the size of China. And whatever you think about the American experience, part of it is predicated on very different protocols than having a, mil a billion people in the North American continent. Uh, freedom, there is a freedom, and I agree, from law, but there's also a different type of freedom. That's freedom from chaos. And the present system is chaotic, and it's partly uh, chaotic because there's no freedom from it. Let me give you an example. If somebody hits you in California and has no driver's license, which is common, and has no insurance, which is common, and has no legality, which is common, you're not allowed, the policeman in most municipalities is not even allowed to arrest that person and detain him as an illegal alien. And the system that we're starting to see today with duplicate IDs, uh, fraudulent identification, and simply no law is chaotic and it's not freedom at all, it's, it's anarchy. I think that uh, in theory, there might be economic arguments for open borders. There's economic arguments for legalization, complete legalization of all drugs as well. It would cut down on enforcement costs. It would allow drugs to be produced in the United States without importation fees from the uh, gross domestic product. But I think the social, ethical, and moral cost, which can't be calibrated in a strict economic sense without weigh those. We've got to remember that same logic applies here. There's moral issues when somebody pays three times the tuition as somebody else who's legal. There's moral issues when once you break the law, you decide which laws are going to be enforced, whether you're breaking them or whether you're enforcing them, which are going to be enforced and which are not. 25% uh, of all immigrant house, uh, illegal immigrant households in California are on public assistance. So while I say I agree with Dr. Powell in a utopian world, we could get rid of these things. We're not going to get rid of them. And the, and the reality we face is that we have 25% on public assistance. Four out of 10 Hispanic students are not graduating from high school in a very competitive environment in California. And that's partly because we have a persistent pool of 3 million people who come without education, English, and legality. 7% of all Hispanics have a bachelor's degree, given this terrible legacy of illegal immigration. So. Uh, I think that we have to deal with the reality that we're faced with. We're not going to eliminate the entitlement system. And finally, the reason that we have these problems with separate language, separate culture, a La Raza chauvinism is not just because of the therapeutic society of the 1960s. It's also because of the size of the illegal immigrant pool. When you have 10 or 12 million people that are constituting an apartheid community, there will be protocols that arise to service that community for <coughs> assimilation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Powell, you have five minutes then to discuss. All right, let me start with a point of agreement again. I think everybody here will agree to some extent that the current system is chaos. I agree that we have problems with moral issues when we're giving someone in-state tuition who came illegally, but someone who came legally does not. Uh, I agree that it's problematic when law enforcement is selective of what laws they enforce on who based on when they got here and how they got there, here. Uh, so I fully support changing the current system. It's a question of what we move to. Uh, the question I do want to address that you brought up is the natural limit question, because I think it's a good one. Um, so for preliminary evidence on this, we can look, because we do have completely open borders with a couple places. Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, our other territories we have completely open immigration from. You can come and go from them as you please. In fact, my brother just moved in the reverse direction to the Virgin Islands to become a chef down there. Um, but we do, now we have seen significant 
parts of the Puerto Rican population moved to the United States, but nowhere near on the magnitude of 50%. And there's significant economic gaps between all of those territories and the standard of living in the United States. But it's not the case that the countries have simply emptied out and come here. And a survey is one thing to ask the population of Mexico now, but I highly doubt you'd see 50% of them come to the United States all of a sudden. Other things that can go with the natural limit here. In fact, just to emphasize why it's not just always economic incentives that push immigration, we have great disparities within the United States in per capita incomes even. What are we at in California now? It must be up over 50,000 for average per capita income there. But West Virginia is less than half of it. They're sitting at about 24,000 per capita right now. The state of West Virginia is not emptying out into California. What comes with the increased flows of immigration is there's other market mechanisms that put limits on it. First, the immigrants have to come here, like someone has to voluntarily provide them a place to come to. That means renting to them, selling a property, or a group of them renting. As more of them come here, it's going to push up the demands for certain properties and bid the price higher, making it so some of them won't come. There is an issue with open land here. As long as the property is privately owned, the costs are internalized, so it's not a big deal. The problem is we can't have them coming just to lay around on public property everywhere. We're certainly not short of space. I took a flight from California here, and we could go for almost an hour at times without seeing anything significant in terms of civilization, really. Just farms spread out with one house and vast stretches in between. So I don't think we're at all constrained in land space. What we have to be careful about is whether we let them come in and roll onto public property, or whether they make them go to where someone's actually willing to voluntarily associate with them. And to say that there's issues other than economics related to this, I completely agree. And the game is to internalize as many of these other things to individual decision making as possible. So issues like whether they should get in-state tuition or not. If this wasn't something where we were subsidizing people from all different states and different backgrounds and tax dollars were doing it, it wouldn't be a problem anyway with immigration. It would be a private good that you have to purchase. I think we have a lot of things in our society that aren't consistent with the principles of a free society that cause these problems that you get with immigration. Now, on the point of calling it utopia versus saying that it's difficult to change these things in our culture and push for these type of political reforms, yeah, it is difficult. In the short run, very unlikely that we could get through these type of reforms. But it's also pretty unlikely that we're going to have a complete policy of closed borders anytime soon. Both are going to be political battles. We might as well do one that moves us towards a freer and more efficient society, not one that moves us away from it. I guess that can be it for the moment. Second, we'll have a second round of rebuttal on Dr. Hanson. Those are good points. I just would like, in the spirit of goodwill, to point out a little difference, that Mexico is not an island like the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico. And it doesn't have 2 to 3 million people, but 100 million people and a 1,500 mile contiguous border that you walk across. And I think it makes it, and the other fourth qualifier is it's not a imbalance of twice the income in California versus, say, West Virginia, but in central Mexico, it's 10 to 15 to 20 times as much. One of the great things that people understand in rural California, when you hire people or you meet people from Oaxaca, we're not talking about people who made a dollar an hour in Jalisco or Oaxaca and now make 10, but made a dollar a day and now make $100 a day. So the attractions are much more from somebody to come from Mexico than from West Virginia. A couple of other things. I think that we both agree that while there are, Dr. Powell has qualifications about open borders, I have qualifications about closed borders. I don't think he means to imply we're just going to open the border up and let any Tom, Dick, and Harry come across. And I don't think we're going to close it to all legal immigrants. I think the system that we have now could be modified to allow about a quarter million people to come that would distinguish us from Europe, allow the economy to grow, and more importantly, allow us to be selective so that we don't just simply privilege one particular country because it happens to be contiguous and allow its citizens to come here illegally. I think it's time to go back and have criteria. And we could ask questions of our would-be immigrants. Do you want to learn the English language? Are you acquainted with the American Constitution? Do you feel that you have a particular skill to bring? One of the odd things about the debate is much of the, even the legal immigration policy is predicated just on kinship. So where we are denying engineers from India or doctors 
from the Philippines, we're allowing people with an eighth grade education to come and be exploited where we really don't get the same bang for the buck because of the present policy. Again, I think it's a question that numbers really do matter. When you have 10 to 15 million people here illegally, and when they come with an average education of an eighth grade education, and when they come primarily from one place, then you have a community that, and given the climate and the landscape in the United States, which has embraced things like bilingual education, multiple languages on voting, then you are encouraging a Quebec or a Rwanda or a Balkanization of society that is a reflection of the reality that you have these numbers. So in a utopian sense, we could go back to the melting pot, but that's going to be increasingly difficult the longer you have open borders and the larger the illegal immigration problem grows. The system is growing to accommodate that population rather than that population accommodating itself to the system. Thank you. Now we have the final five minutes, Dr. Powell. Yeah, I agree that that population should have to accommodate to the system as opposed to vice versa, and that's really what I agitate for in immigration. The best way to fix our illegal immigration problem with all of the secondary concepts that come to it is opening up our borders in a way that gets rid of illegal immigration, not by erecting a fence, but by allowing them in legally. I don't understand why the quarter million criteria, I don't know what number makes that, what reason makes that optimal. And certainly some immigrants come with more skills than others, but through basic comparative advantage in economics, all of them benefit us in some way, as long as it's a mutually advantageous transaction. We both agree whether it's a doctor for $50 an hour or $100 an hour, or a lawnmower person for $8 an hour, his alternatives and we're better off than otherwise. So as long as there's someone who's coming in here to provide legitimate economic services and not violate the property rights and freedoms of existing Americans, I'm in favor of bigger quantities, not a quarter million, not 500,000, but whatever the people in our society want to freely associate with. Stifling at any number below what they want to do necessarily harms not only Mexicans and immigrants who want to get here, but people in the United States who wish to benefit from associating with them. Now we shift gears a little bit to the question phase, and so we give Dr. Hanson a chance to ask a question or propound a theory or an idea to Dr. Powell and then get his response, and then that will be reversed. I think we agree on a lot of things, Dr. Powell. What would you respond, and again, I'm not trying to quote polls, but most of the polls I've seen said that currently 81%, 80% of the American people are opposed to the status quo, which I guess we could call what they consider open borders, and want to have the present immigration policies enforced. So whatever you and I disagree, there's going to be, whatever we agree or disagree on, there's this other gigantic animal in the room, which is public opinion, which seems to be that four out of five people do not favor your point of view. Yeah, I don't think that's the case, though. It's not that four out of five don't favor my point of view. It's four out of five don't favor the results of our current chaotic policy, which is not what I'm pushing for. And part of the benefit of doing these forums is educating that there's a difference between open immigration policy and de facto open immigration while we remain making it illegal, because that's what gives us all of these negative consequences that you rightly point out. But in all sincerity, if I could follow up. In all sincerity, if you were to make this case and say the present system is broken, you can make it to people in the room and say, I've got a better solution. We will simply, with some checks on legality, we'll just open the borders and let anybody who wants to come in, I think that you'll find that even more than 80 percent oppose that. I don't know if you'll find more than 80 percent oppose it, but whether you do or not, whether you find 90 percent to oppose it, because of this popular opinion on any number of issues doesn't make it right or wrong and really doesn't sway me from articulating what I think is the correct economic and just position. The game for an intellectual is not to say what's politically, actually this is a famous quote of Hayek, right? The job of an intellectual is not to do what's politically practical, but to do the policies that are right with the intention of making them politically practical in the long run. That's our job. We're not just intellectuals in some sense. We're policy makers, too, and we have to deal with what's within the realm of reality. Let me ask you another question. Since citizenship is essential to a democratic society, how would you, if you were mistaken, and you might be mistaken in the numbers that actually came, let's say that 10 million came the first year, how would you inculcate them any common sense of commonwealth, language, knowledge of their host country? How would you do that? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, that number of people. We have programs already that we do this with immigrants who come here before they can apply for citizenships. Those programs will have to be reevaluated and restructured, but it's not fundamentally something we can't do. But if we're basically failing to do it now and we increase the magnitude of income incoming by 10 million people, what makes you think? Well, it's not the legal ones that we're failing to do it now with. It's the illegals who aren't ever part of the process that we're failing to do it with. So my system would actually fix that by not making them illegals anymore, but by bringing them into the legal realm where the system does work reasonably well. Well, you're, but who are the people who are, let's say, to take an example of Mexico, if we let in 10 million people from Mexico, do you think that by doing that we would be able to reverse bilingualism, La Raja Chauvinism, just by simply making them legal and sort of interrupt the last 20 years of... No, just making them legal doesn't do that by itself, but just making them legal doesn't abolish the welfare state either that gives them these transfers. These are all problems that have to be addressed, but they're not problems of immigration per se. But remember... Your position, and this is one of the ironies of this debate, would be accepted wholeheartedly by the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, but it would also be accepted wholeheartedly by the National Council of La Raza for quite different reasons. So why you see this as something that's logical and works for uh, the economic benefit of the United States, other people would agree with you because they would see entirely different results from it. In other words, they would see a massive influx of people from Mexico, a constituency that would have historical grievances against the United States, might not assimilate, would have claims of a separate language, and would demand collective and group representation, i.e., they would want a, uh, a different type of state. But La Raza isn't the average Mexican who comes here. They don't represent their views very well at all. The vast majority of them want to come here to get ahead and make their families better. They do, but if you look at the political leadership, for example, in the California state legislature, that does not, the people who are making policy in California, as we saw in the, the recent governorship with uh, candidate Bustamante, they do not reflect that view for some reason. They reflect a La Raza point of view. That's what's, I think, a lot of problems with the California legislature. Yeah. That's why uh, the. As a general point, though, issue was such a sorry, Congressman, but as a general point, quite often politics doesn't reflect the views of society. I think this is one case where it's it's failing in Cal in California. This I'll let you off the hook in that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is interesting. What do you say we just continue this as a conversation rather than question? Now, Dr. Powell, you might want to. Yes. You know, we've had plenty of back and forth here. If you want to close it up and then go to the audience, we can do that. Okay, I well, kind of asked you if, questions if back. If that's the case, then that. we do that. Then let, let's just shift gears and we thank you. We did a very nice job. <laughs>
It's just not going to happen. I think the more wise problem, the more wise solution, excuse me, would to have some minimum criteria of two or three years residency that allows you to go through a process of citizenship with a qualifier that we've had seven rolling amnesties and each one has not been enforced and each one was said to be the last one and each one encouraged more illegal immigration. But if we could have an amnesty that would be tied with border enforcement, employer sanctions, and a legal quote of, uh, I just picked that 250000 because that's one that we've historically used. I think that would be the answer. One of the problems I have about the guest worker program is I grew up with the Brocero program and the idea that everybody's going to join the guest worker program and then say 350,000 people will come and the other million will say, I didn't get into the program, I'll stay back in Mexico, is crazy. The people who are not in the guest worker will still want to come. You'll still have to have enforcement, but you now you'll suffer the additional hypocrisy of bringing a little bit of legality to a whole lot of illegality. And then you'll have a permanent pool of exploited war, uh, workers. Finally, I, I don't want to dominate, as Dr. Powell will have comments, but remember there was a whole literature, whether it's CBS News, Harvest of Shame documentaries, or um, our, uh, Woody Guthrie's Deportee, a whole popular culture group in the 50s and 60s about the Becerro program that was in fact from 1947 to 65. And the idea was that when that thing ended in October, if you could go to places like Delano in California, and I did, people did not want to go home. The way that we got the Braceros to go home was we paid them 75 cents an hour, we being the California agricultural industry, and we gave 50 cents to them, and we sent the other 25 cents to the Mexican government. We know now that the other 25 cents was stolen and they never received it, but that was the only bribe that we could get to leave, make people go back because even though they were working and in compounds, they found the conditions so attractive that they wanted to break the law and not go back to Mexico. And I think that anybody who thinks that those same conditions will not reoccur is very naive. On just the issue of... Uh, of deportation now with current illegals. What we face is clearly a credible commitment problem, and we've done it six, seven times before. And any time that you do grant the amnesty, you are going to encourage more illegal immigration. Um, I mean, it's a ceteris paribus thing. If you, uh, <clears throat> even if you do increase border security, uh, you're still going to increase more immigrants coming than you would have otherwise if you hadn't done an amnesty. That said, these are the type of people, for the most part, that if they haven't been doing criminal acts and there's no other reason to deport them that they've been here for 10 years, 5 years, 30 years and they've been working, the ones that we want coming through through illegal immigration anyway. Uh, and just morally I can't see tearing them out of here even if they did get here uh, by cheating the system compared to others who are waiting outside. I couldn't watch them pulling people from their house and deporting them, uh, people who otherwise minded their own business. Uh, but I think part of the answer to it then is how do we fix it without making more illegal immigration worse is by opening up not to 50,000 but to large numbers of other immigrants who want to come here so that there's just no need for more illegal immigration. So de facto legal, like legalize the ones who are already here but then open it up to more immigration is how I deal with it. We face those very same issues in 81 and I guess they're always going to be recurring and the, and the point that we tried to do was to put increased border security and put the employer sanctions program in to penalize employers who knowingly hired an undocumented alien. But because, as recently as Sunday, the New York Times in the business section, um, Eduardo Porter has had a story about how enforcement of the immigration law stops at the workplace, which gets back to the point both of the gentlemen have made about the employers who, first of all, will sometimes look away from the law, but secondly, they have a deep need to have low-cost labor. And so the laws have not been enforced as they should be. So I, I still stand behind our use of a legalization program in 86, which they say hasn't worked. I think it would have worked and would have worked superbly had the governments, and that's a Democrat and Republican, been devoted to the idea that they needed to enforce the border and they needed to enforce workplace uh, to be sure that employers didn't uh, skirt the law. Uh, uh, yes, Bill, uh, president of the uh, student body. Uh -huh. um, thank you all both for being here today. I guess I have a question I'd like both of you to address. Um, We've come to agreement that there's a major problem with the current system of immigration. We've also discussed that upwards of 80% agree that this is politically not feasible. Some of the reforms that we've discussed are not feasible. So what steps can we take, and I know these are different steps for both of you, but that would be politically feasible in the immediate future to take steps towards, um, I guess, uh, taming this situation? 
Dr. Powell, why don't you start on this one? Sure. A politically feasible thing in the short term that would be a step in my direction, although not my ultimate policy, would just be increased quotas across the board, not just for Mexico, but for all the different countries who have people wanting to come here. So I think that in the short term is something that is much more politically feasible. And if we can increase those legal immigrant flows and show that we're not getting the same negative consequences that happen with our current policy, I think that might be able to provide future momentum to more opening of immigration. Dr. Hanson? Before I answer that, I would just make one point about guest workers. One of the industries, I'll give you one small example, we were all told that could never be mechanized was the California raisin industry because it's very hard to pick grapes on a trellis, put them on a piece of paper, dry them into raisins, and you all eat them as sun-made raisins. That depended on 40,000 illegal aliens who were the only people who were willing to do that back-breaking work at a price that would allow a California farmer to compete with somebody in Turkey or South Africa. When that pool has started to dry up, as it has, lo and behold, a radical new technology is developed of trellising the vines, mechanically cutting the canes, and drying the grapes that you're eating at SunMade on the vine solely as a result of a perceived idea that the employer might be sanctioned or there might be a shortage of uh, cheap laborers. And I suggest that throughout history, when you have available cheap labor, it tends to be a hedge against mechanization and efficiency. And if, when you start to find employers and make people legal and have some get your hands around immigration, you will start to see efficiencies appear in industries that, that whether it's meat packing or hotel industry that people just assure you can't be improved. As far as the solutions, I think it's a tripartite. One is that we have to have employer sanctions. Two, increase border security. And three, to be quite frank, you have to change the climate and go back to the melting pot in the United States, that we have a common language, a common culture, and that the salad bowl uh, imagery did not work. And when people from, many people know when Mexico, if they come from Mexico, they'll have to do so legally. They'll have to very quickly learn the English language. They will not be able to vote or go to court or see a doctor simply in Spanish. That that itself will be a, uh, a very careful consideration. I just left the emergency room at the Salma Hospital in my local town, and a doctor said to me something that struck me. I was the only person in the emergency room of 40 people who spoke English, the only person who had health insurance. And I waited, and after two and a half hours, uh, I waited after a woman from Oaxaca was in her third tri trimester pregnant, and the doctor who treated her said she had no health insurance. And he laughed and he said, we're the only country in the world that not only will give this immigrant here illegally wonderful health care, but I will have to put her down as a, as a statistic of somebody the system failed by not giving prenatal care. Can I just jump in for one second sure, before sure. we go back? Because uh, On the point about mechanization, though, you're misusing economic efficiency. It is a, there's a technical efficiency of like a supply line moving, mechanization, and then there's economic efficiency. The very fact that the raisin growers weren't mechanizing earlier tells you that the cost of mechanization, the cost of creating the technology, putting it in place, was greater than the benefit they were going to get from using the labor. It was efficient for them to use the labor. When you take away the labor, then it becomes efficient for them to do something else, but that is less efficient than using the labor. No, because the, in actual dollars, the cost of uh, using, after you invest the equipment, and the depreciation, most studies say the cost per uh, ton of harvesting mechanically is about $75. That's a, that's a variable cost per harvesting, not the risk-adjusted cost of developing a new technology to go about But doing a, after the technology is... Yeah, sure. Now it's efficient for that to be done. But going into it, it was not just like right now. The cheap labor we have on farms is more efficient to use than investing in other technologies to replace Well, it's $350 a ton now to hire somebody to do it. Right. Right now, now that that technology exists, it's more but efficient. Going into it, it is not more but efficient. But you're also forgetting another cost, and that's something that is the subtext of this entire debate, that it's not just economics, because by hiring people to do the raisin industry at uh, $350 a ton and paying them a wage that they cannot live in, live on, then you create all sorts of problems. We talked about housing, but we didn't talk about this change in the nature of housing, where we have a big problem about zoning in our local community, where we have eight and nine people and ten people living in a one-bedroom apartment, or we have now a uh, police department that's bankrupt, or a hospital that's bankrupt. These are all indirect costs from using uh, 
low-wage labor in the raisin industry. Right. The key, the whole game that's going on here, though, is that right now you have inefficiently subsidized labor because they don't have to pay their full cost of being here through the housing, through the other things that are passed on to other people in the community. And they make that more efficient than using farming equipment. The only way to get the economically efficient outcome isn't to just artificially limit the cheap labor coming in. It's to internalize those other spillover costs of the labor. Then you get economic decision making that corresponds with these other social things you're talking about. But one last thing, sure. I want to get to the questions. Your plan of letting almost anybody who comes in who is not criminal doesn't mean that we're not going to get rid of cheap labor because what's going to happen, you might, you, one thing we haven't talked about is the theoretical number. Is it 10 million? Is it 20 million? You get 30 million people who come from Mexico, you will have cheap labor whether they're illegal or legal. You will only have cheap labor to the extent that they can afford to live somewhere if they're not being subsidized to live there. That's the natural check on immigration. Unfortunately, what happens is by subsidizing them and allowing them to spill over their costs onto other people, you get more movement than would be optimal. Well, well given the name, we will subsidize. <laughs> we'll move on now. Young people have to realize what a, a wonderful experience you've had listening to a classicist debate an economist on the subject of economy. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, a, that's a pretty cool idea all the way around. Let me just add one little thing and then turn to questions because we've heard about the melting pot. I think it was Dr. Zwingli or someone who did the original play in which the melting pot developed where all of us come into the pot, whether from Italy or wherever, and come in, we all come out the same color. Then there's a salad bowl where we never lose our color, period. Each individual leaf is green or yellow or red. I like to think of a thing more like a mosaic, where individual pieces are there, they never change. But if you remove yourself from the picture far enough, they blend together, and you don't see the joints, you don't see the differences. They come and they make a, a very beautiful picture. So I think there's yet another alternative between the, the, the melting pot and the salad bowl, and that would be what I call the great American mosaic. Yes? My question is directed more to Dr. Powell. Uh, you presented an argument, you said that it would radical or revolutionize, and I'm wondering at what point, in order for public policy, and you have both kind of alluded to that, or the roles between scholar and public policy, at what point will the general public have to care? Is there a certain catalyst or mechanism that must be in place in order for the U.S. to revamp um, immigration policy? Um, and if so, like, when, when do you think that will happen? Right now, you both are saying that um, it's an issue, it's a problem, people recognize it, but nothing's being done, uh, it's not being enforced, that sort of thing. At what point um, would your action, um, at what point would your your proposal move into action? Okay, good. I don't. So, of course, I don't have a precise answer. I think as the current system fails more and more, we move more towards where some sort of reform is going to happen. But you raise another interesting question that comes up uh, in terms of if I could get my ideal policy through, um, what would be other secondary consequences of that? And the, the response earlier is, sure, it would be optimal if we didn't have a welfare state and these other spillover costs, but part of what takes reform, what could push reform on those system and things would be immigration itself. That sort of mass flow is going to reveal a lot of the inefficiencies in that program that could, right now can pass under the political radar screen and might cause more reform there. Uh, so actually, although it's traditionally associated with a lot of liberal positions that they should favor massive immigration, uh, they're going to find that it also is going to put a lot of pressure and eliminate uh, or at least put into a question whether politically other programs they favor should still exist. I just comment that I think uh, Dr. Powell has kind of an ironic situation when most of the people in the United States are worried about a pool somewhere of 10 to 12 million illegal immigration uh, immigrants. There, I don't think that the argument that the problem is that we have too few immigrants is going to be is going to. That's just a political reality. The reality is that the reform movement is going to come from the other side. Uh, second, I kind of had this debate before, although I wouldn't want to impugn somebody else's uh, arguments to Dr. Powell, with the late editor of the Wall Street Journal, Robert Bartlett. Mm. And he said something to me in the middle of this that I thought was struck. He said, that finally he got exasperated and said that we don't, he wanted open borders. And he said, the problem is not an immigration problem, it's a minimum wage problem. And he used a free market model and said, if we could just eliminate the minimum wage, then when it got down to two or three dollars, people from Mexico would find it's not in their interest to come, given our increased cost. And there's, of course, as I said to him, but you're not going to be in the communities where that process works out over four or five years. And that's part of the problem that I have with the entire debate, that a lot of people have models. But if you would go to a place like Parlier, California, or Orange Cove, 
or Mendota, and you would see the consequences of somebody sending half their wages back to Mexico and what it does to that community, the drain leaving that community. Or you go into a community where the illiteracy rate at California State University systems, 52% of every freshman cannot take a college course because they don't know English. Or you have a system where eight out of ten people who are arrested in my hometown don't have a driver's license. You see that the, these problems are not theoretical. They're right in the immediate. And maybe in the long term it might, it might ask you these problems. But right now, people, average people have very little bit legitimate concerns. And it's not that we don't have enough immigrants. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I, I would like to direct a question to Dr. Hansen. Um, in your first rebuttal, you pointed out that there are Filipino physicians awaiting entrance to the United States while there are illegal, uneducated Mexicans just freely coming into the United States. And I would just like to know, historically, the, in, those individuals that immigrated to the United States were bright, talented, and motivated, and generally kind of helped to fill positions in the United States and motivate people. So is that still the case today, or has that changed? You know, I'm sorry I didn't hear the last part of your question. So really, are the um, individuals still bright, talented, and motivated like they were historically? The yeah, I don't want to pick on people from Mexico because my same model would suggest that if you were a doctor or a professor, I don't want to say professors have much to offer that society, but if you were, let's say, an <laughs> architect and you wanted to come from Mexico, you would be much better off crossing the border illegally because if you offered your skills to the United States government, you'd have to go through a legal process that would take much longer and cost much more than coming across illegally with an eighth grade education. So it wasn't specific to Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines. But I, I'm torn by this. I think Dr. Powell is too because we're dealing with two diametrically opposed factors and I can see it again to use that over you overused word empirically. In my experience, living with, in a community that's 90 percent Hispanic, I'm torn because on the one hand, you have a natural selection of audacious risk takers who are willing to give up everything and go to a foreign place and experience extreme hardship in the hope that something will be better, not necessarily for themselves, but for their children. And that's a very good, that's a great positive. But I'm not sure that that couldn't be done legally as well with a legal immigrant. But on the other hand, with the present system is you've also dealt with somebody who feels that the law does not apply to them. They, they were here illegally, and they live each day a law that is in the shadows. So what happens insidiously, perhaps, there starts to, to be a mentality that grows that the law should not apply to me and will not apply to me because I broke it to get here, and I break it every day to stay here. So there's two different factors involved. And on any given day, I think uh, when I see people getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning when most people in Fresno are asleep and they're out hammering shingles on a new development, most of them are illegal aliens from Mexico. It's very impressive. On the other hand, when I drive by my farm and I see tons of garbage and I see people from Mexico who don't have access to dumpsters apparently, dumping it each day uh, and causing a, a public health crisis, then I get depressed because I feel that this is illegal and the laws are not being enforced because people themselves broke the law to, be, to come and stay here. Good. We'll have our last question, Anthony Cash. All right. <clears throat> We've seen historically mass numbers of people from one uh, society migrate to small areas of the United States. Speaking specifically, you know, you've seen the Irish migrate heavily to the areas of the Northeast, the Italians migrate heavily to areas of the Northeast, Germans in the Midwest. But eventually they do assimilate. What makes the Hispanic immigration in the Southwest different? And if, if it is different, how can we make it similar so that those people will also be forced to assimilate? I think the best way to make it similar is to provide them with the type of incentive structure that the prior immigration waves faced. And actually, you do a good job in part of your book about outlining different generations of Mexican workers and assimilation now versus prior. Uh, when it was before we had this, the kind of culture that we do now in America. So I think going back to our old 19th century model for immigrants where they can come in in large flows in a geographic area and, and still assimilate. I mean, back then, they weren't coming for any sort of tax transfers or entitlements at all. They were all coming to work, but that didn't mean they didn't get social services either. Traditionally, what immigrants groups did was through voluntary associations, mutual aid societies is how they'd take care of each other when they found themselves out of work or between jobs or if, they're, if they fall ill. Uh, so I think that moving us back to that type of assimilate, uh, 
institutional environment will help them assimilate more and can do so without really socially harming them by the things that we think we need to provide them with government. I would just add in closing one harsh anecdote that I hope won't reflect poorly on me, but I went to a rural school where there were six people who were not Hispanic, and one of, two of them were my brothers. And that same school now is 99%. But here was the difference. We had a speech therapist, how cruel and insensitive, that got us up in every week we had to speak English. And we had this phrase called, I have a stick shift Chevy. And everybody said, well, I have a stick shift Chevy. And she would say, no, you're n and this is what she would say, and this is, I think, important. You're never going to compete with the people in Fresno unless you speak perfect English. You have a onus on you because you came here from Mexico, and it's my job to make sure you're better educated and you speak English much more efficiently. That system was thrown out the window, and we had one of the highest test scores actually in the county, that same school today uh, in the local achievement test, uh, almost 90% failed after 20 years of bilingualism that encouraged uh, English almost as a second language. I will say, final one statement, that we have had a pro problem, we have had in history a policy de facto of completely open borders. And that was Rome in the fifth century when, whether out of design or intent, Romans thought that it was no longer worth patrolling the Danube and the Rhine and that the people on the other side should be allowed to come into Rome, viscos, goss, and vandals. I don't want to use those deprecating terms. <laughs> and I think that you would make the argument that Rome uh, in the 6th century AD was quite a different place than it was in the 4th. It, it, just, just a fun point. I mean, you're the classicist, but uh, the institutional environment of Rome is radically different from what we have in the United States and the type of property arrangements and markets that were allowed. Um, I think it's what our system is based on, actually. No, no, no. Not, just our, <laughs> not our legal code. Our property rights and system of capitalism is not something the same as Romans. I think it would be very Because getting the stakeholders in the society is different. Well, <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. But one final, one final thought. To get back to Anthony's question about assimilation, um, if Barbara Jordan, a fantastic member of Congress with whom I serve, had lived longer than she did, she chaired an, an immigration committee, which made a major report, a, a magnum opus kind of report, in which she talked about assimilation, the need to have something in America we could all more or less agree upon, some kind of a, a, a common denominator. If Barbara, because of her persuasiveness, because of her persona, because of her stentorian voice and all the other attributes she had, if she had lived long enough, she might have been the one person to pull off some kind of a response to this whole idea of how do we become Americans even though we're from a lot of different places and have a lot of different cultures. But again, gentlemen, well done. We thank you very much.